Okay, um, it's exactly six o'clock, so that must mean it's time to start um, our third UCM Talks lecture for our 21-22 season. Um, my name is Gail Curran, I'm the Higher Education Manager at UCN, and uh, I'm delighted to see so many people uh, coming along to, uh, now I've got to concentrate and do two things at once, which is let people in and talk to you, hang on, um, to tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. We're now in our fourth series of UCM Talks, and uh, the focus of our UCM Talks series is to um, showcase this research that is occurring on Ireland or about our island. And it's designed to be eclectic, which it is, that's for sure, and also to encourage the sharing of new ideas and thinking. Um, we decided this year to continue to do our uh, our series online um, and with tonight's yellow weather warning and what is an obvious hooli blowing out there I think I'm quite pleased that we're all safe at home and comfortable to, to listen to the, tonight's talk. Before introducing tonight's talk and talker uh, just a few rules about how, how these these sort of events run and I'm sure we're all familiar with online uh, lectures after the last couple of years but uh, just to let you know, this is being recorded, um, and the reason for it being recorded is that we we make it available to watch, it, listen again, or watch again on the UCM website. Christopher is the Collections Care and Conservation Manager at Manx National Heritage, uh, a role he's been in since 2007. And uh, Christopher tells me that by training he is a sculpture conservator, but has broadened out significantly from that during his career and prior to coming to the Isle of Man worked in England, France and Italy. Um, so we're, as always with our UCM talk presenters we're really lucky to have um, Christopher with us tonight and I'll say from the beginning how appreciative I am of the time taken to prepare uh, the talk that he's going to give us tonight and that talk is CAD and Historic Structures Reconstructing the Peggy. Now, the, much, uh, the island's much-loved Peggy has had quite a bit of media exposure in recent months, but her resting place is not the subject of tonight's talk from Christopher. Rather, it's challenging the question, how do we record important information about complex 3D objects when we conserve or we restore them? And drawing on his 30 years of experience, um, Christopher offers some solutions to that question and considers the application of those solutions to the 233 year old Peggy. I, just, I did that maths very quickly in my head, so I hope that's right. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll now hand over to our, our guest lecturer for tonight's UCM Talks, Christopher Weeks. Thank you. Yes, hello everybody. Um, the talk tonight is about um, the boat Peggy, um, but it's about other things as well. Um, there may be some people who are uh, not familiar with uh, Peggy. Uh, here it is, built in 1789 um, for a man called George Quayle, who was a banker and businessman. And from contemporary sources such as account books and letters, we get a good deal of information about the creation of this boat and its working life. And it's from these that we know that she, the Peggy, was originally built for racing. And she was to sliding keels. These are the progenitors of the drop keels that you see on modern yachts. And whilst those keels are now lost, we do have, and you can see on the right-hand side of this image against the wall, um, the masts and spars, the original masts and spars. Um, that survive. And that allows us, remarkably enough, to reconstruct uh, the rig of the boat. In her original form, she had, um, uh, she had a license to carry swivel guns, and the license from the Admiralty, the British Admiralty, survives to this day, as do the guns. They're not in the shot, they're just beyond the prow of the ship. The lines are reminiscent of a naval cutter, perhaps, um, or um, in her construction, she was probably typical of local craft, actually. Um, but no other examples of those survive. She was, of course, entirely hand built, and all of her timbers were finished with uh, tools like knife planes. She was fixed together with iron nails, and she was presumably intended to enjoy a working life of about 20 years. And she was, of course, built on the Isle of Man 
in Castletown by a man named Kelly. Uh, why is this boat significant and, and why are we bothering to talk about it at all? Well, apart from all of these details, remarkable though they may be in themselves, it's the state of her preservation, fundamentally, uh, which marks out the Peggy as being of specialty. And uh, she is a unique survival of 18th century yachting. And her preservation is mainly due to 200 years of enforced neglect in the boat cellar uh, that George Quayle built for her adjoining his house in Castletown. National Historic Ships, which is the uh, UK body set up to um, um, advise and administer the preservation of historic vessels in the United Kingdom, made a special exception to accommodate the Peggy on the National Historic Reg Ships Register of Historic Vessels. In fact, um, not only is the not in the UK, Peggy isn't even a ship, she's too small. Um, so that was quite a remarkable thing in itself. Um, but on top of that, Peggy is inscribed on the National Historic Fleet, which is a subset of those vessels that are of supreme national importance. And to quote from their website, she is the last remaining intact shallop and the world's oldest surviving schooner. Peggy is one of the few surviving 18th century boats and is a unique source of information relating to small vessel structure and form at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Now, uh, not content with that, uh, Manx National Heritage, uh, ourselves, we have published a statement of significance. Um, and this statement of significance, which I'll throw up an image of now, um, is entitled George Quayle and his legacy. And this is, um, this is to uh, reflect the fact that what we have here on the Isle of Man is a boat, the Peggy, but we also have associated buildings, documents, and archives relating to it and the life and times of George Quayle. And these taken as a whole um, uh, are a body that is uh, highly significant on an international level. If you're interested in reading the statement of significance, you can see the web address at the bottom of the page uh, where it's published on our website. And we've also sought um, external review from uh, historians, maritime historians, and other related uh, heritage professionals to make sure that we are pitching things at the right level. So if we turn to the boat itself, um, it's certainly a very complicated three-dimensional object. It comprises many thousands of pieces of timber, iron, and paint. Now, each of these pieces has a story to tell, and each is important to the whole. Each varies in its condition and also in its state of preservation. In this photograph, for example, you can see some features such as uh, the iron, the original iron mast collars and bowsprit rings to support bits of rigging. You can see the original mooring bits here. The mooring bit is a, is a piece of wood that uh, sticks up over the edge of the boat that can tie ropes onto. Um, the ones that I've indicated here currently don't stick up over the edge of the boat, and that's because George Quayle raised the gunnels of the boat in about 1802. But in its original 1789 form, these were the mooring bits. And the funny thing about these is on the top, they have holes, and those holes were for the guns. So that's how George Quayle mounted his guns. You can also see down here some striations on the timber. And those are, it looks a little bit like wet fingers through clay. Those are the marks of the knife plane. And those serve to underline perhaps the hand-built nature of this object. And there's so much more besides, a complicated object. Uh, the transom, the rear of the boat, um, neatly shows us that this is a boat belonging to George Quayle Castletown, as you can see. Uh, but also, and I won't attempt to try to pick it out for you, underneath that is the original decoration, gilded letters on a green ground, the word Peggy. So in a stroke, you see that this is a boat called Peggy belonging to George Quayle of Castletown. There can be no doubt of that. And a complicated remain of paint in and of its own right. 
So what is the aim of the conservation programme that we've been engaged in? Well, as much as possible, we wish to retain the material and meaning of each piece. If you reference, at the very least, each of these needs to be recorded so that uh, future custodians can assess their importance and their rate of decay. And for all the minute observations and interventions that we make, we need a canvas, figuratively speaking, upon which to record them. Now, we're not the first people, of course, to make a detailed record of this boat. In fact, um, this uh, lines plan that I'm now showing, I hope has come up on your screens. There's always a bit of a delay. Pardon me if it's annoying. This lines plan was drawn in 1968, and it is the most accurate lines plan that we own. Um, it is, in fact, the highest level of accuracy that you could achieve with a lines plan and was prepared very, very carefully. But still, as a means of recording the actual state of Peggy and her individual timbers, it falls very far short. So the structure of this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some of the kinds of information that I'm talking about that conservators need to record. I'm going to introduce some examples to illustrate this and the difficulties of recording this information on large scale three dimensional objects. I'm going to consider the problems posed by boats in particular, and of course, Peggy is one of those. And I'm going to ask finally the question of whether 3D recording could help with some of these difficulties. But first, I'm going to take you back in time, uh, hundreds of years, even further, to look at this object, which is Amiens Cathedral. Now, Amiens Cathedral um, is close to my heart because 30 years ago, I was involved in a team uh, of conservators working on the west front of this building. Um, and it's in, uh, it's in North France in the top, by the way. It's a very flat landscape you can see lying around it. The cathedral was built between 1220 and 1240, and it's partly for this reason that um, it is such a beautiful and homogenous, perfect expression of Gothic style. And it's built entirely from local lands, lands, limestone. I was working on the west front. You can't see that in this image, but in the next image you can. So I'll change the slide. And on the left, a picture of the west front of Amiens Cathedral. Uh, it's extremely large, as you can probably tell. It is 60 meters tall, 200 feet tall, and, and it's covered in hundreds of original sculptures. And particularly in the three deep set portals at the bottom that you can see, those sculptures retain a lot of the paint that with which formerly they would have been decorated. Since the classical period, for those of you who don't know, sculpture, especially sculpture in stone and wood, would always have been painted. And it wasn't until the high Renaissance that that fashion began to wane. From the Romanesque and Gothic periods in Europe, very little indeed of this decoration survives. And so a painted ensemble of sculpture by the ones cathedral are of critical archaeological importance. So our team were cleaning the south portal, the so-called portal of the Mother of God, who you can see circled. And even that's pretty large. It's 20 meters tall and, uh, and six meters deep. That's 70 feet by 20 feet. And it's decorated with about 200 sculptures. And I should add, actually, that the, the photographs that you see here um, were taken after we'd finished the restoration of the entire West Front. So it doesn't look like it did when we started. Um, now, on the photograph on the right, there are two sculptures um, circled. The first of them is uh, the, the sculpture of the Virgin and Child, and this was particularly challenging for us because it retains in parts up to about 30 layers of medieval paint. Um, and in the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about that sculpture and the kind of problems it posed us. Referring to the upper circle sculpture, I'll show you the kinds of documentation that we used to record uh, our observations on these complex surfaces. 
So the first thing you notice, now that I've changed the slide to, uh, to show you the virgin and child close up, before we'd done any work, is number one, the terrible photography, which uh, we had to put up with in those days, color print photography. But also you'll notice an entirely unbroken black surface. Um, and what you probably can't see is a lot of grit and dust and pigeon droppings on top of that. And uh, what we're trying to record when we're working on these things, when we're looking at them before starting work, during work, and then when we've finished, are the kinds of details that I've listed on the right. And it can be very, very challenging. Um, the ones at the bottom, by the way, the restorations and modern coatings, you'll not really be able to see those. But just to uh, inform you, because it's not obvious, for example, the nose of the Virgin and the head of the Christ child, are both made of plaster, and those date from 1860. So that's the kind of detail that we had to try to pick apart. So we, do, we record all this kinds of information, surface decay and so on, before, during and after our work. Uh, this is a picture of me in 1993, um, doing some uh, observations in the vault of the portal. I'm sitting in front of um, some uh, sculptures of Old Testament kings, and I'm using a video microscope and marking down my observations. And I'll give you an example of the kind of uh, paperwork that I'm using in the next, next slide. Here uh, are the kind of things that I'm writing on. These are actual documents that, uh, that I prepared while I was working there. Um, each sculpture had a little dossier, and in the little dossier were pieces of paper upon which were stuck photographs line drawings, and I reproduced some text from previous reports. There was space for notes here. You can see my handwriting, scribbles, and also in the top left, there's a sort of table. And in the table, we were collecting observations, of the colors of layers of paint that we could see. Um, and at the end of three years of work, all of this information and data was collated into a giant report. But it's really, really difficult to uh, show on these two dimensional drawings and photographs observations that, um, that we made um, behind what you can see or underneath what you can see. So anything that you can't see on a two dimensional image is very difficult to refer to. And it was intensely frustrating sometimes to be faced with that problem. So um, the next slide finishes off this little diversion into medieval France with um, a picture of the Sonne Lumière at Tamiens Cathedral, which is based on the polychromy, the paint observations that we made in 1993 to 1995. Um, and each night, if you go to Amiens, if you're lucky enough to see this, it's very beautiful, projected onto each individual sculpture is a naturalistic light show that shows the, um, the paint colors as they may have appeared in the medieval period. I should say it's very beautiful. It's not very accurate, but anyway, enough of that. I'll bring you back up to date by talking about the main subject, which is the boat. And in this slide, the boat is hanging from a string on the day in January, 2015, when we removed her from her incarceration in a cellar for conservation in, um, in Douglas, in the building in which I'm actually sitting, funnily enough. And here she is in her conservation unit, um, pictured on the left, and some features that we wish to record um, about Peggy on the right. I'm not going to go into these in detail, um, but some of this data is, uh, is data that I am personally recording. Others appear in reports that we have commissioned. And since 2009, I've been commissioning reports uh, about Peggy from scientists and other specialists to um, better inform our way forward. Here are some pages from the, um, the report on the iron nails um, and uh, a paint report, an independent conservation report, and top right, there's um, an extract from the timber survey that was undertaken by Hutton and Rostron in 2016. Now, all of these reports 
rely on two-dimensional images to record their data, uh, despite the fact that they're talking about a very complicated three-dimensional object. And I'll give you an example in the next, next slide. This is a detail from the Hutton and Rostrum report. And you can see actually what they've done is they've taken the 1968 lines plan that I shared with you earlier, and they've marked on their observations. These are uh, levels of moisture content in the timbers of Peggy. And maybe at first glance, you might think that this accurately shows the location of readings and samples. But if you were to try to find these on the Peggy itself, it could be quite difficult because none of the detail of the boat itself is actually on these drawings. So there are no, for example, drawing, there's no lines of planks. So that's a bit of a problem. Referring to those line, those planks, for example, or the individual timbers of the boat might help it, us to pinpoint exactly where observations were made. So how do we describe the parts of a boat? And this is a pretty vexed subject. This is a bit of a joke slide, and it's, um, it's an example of a boat glossary, I suppose you could say, and a pretty ridiculous one at that. But it is a joke about how complicated naval technology and terminology is, I should say. In the next slide, there's a sublime example of um, a glossary. This is um, the Visual Encyclopedia of Nautical Terms Under Sail which I've used a lot in conjunction with other sources to help me to name in my ignorance the various different elements of Peggy with the proper terminology. So let's say I've got to the end of my exercise of naming and I can name every single part of the boat with confidence. What then? Well, um, there is published guidelines about um, how to use that terminology further to document the, a boat like this. National Historic Ships, in fact, um, created a series of um, volumes um, called Understanding Historic Vessels. And the two that I've used most uh, when I've been uh, working on Peggy are volumes one and volume three. Volume one and three. We've been able to adapt the approach is quite well to what we've been doing. So in the next slide, for example, I've got um, a table that I've pulled from one of those volumes, which shows levels of recording for historic ships and boats that owners of historic ships and boats may aspire to. Um, and they're suggesting that this is a hierarchy. And at the right hand side, construction plans that's the highest level of recording to which you may be able to aspire. Now we've got lines plans, we don't need general arrangement plans. What does a construction plan consist of? Now already on this slide, you'll see that the jargon is pretty headache inducing. I would invite you not to bother trying looking at all of that and to concentrate on the last item on the list, which is the most important from our point of view, the rationalization of the object into numbered and constituent parts. How could we achieve this? Does three-dimensional imaging offer an alternative to two-dimensional plans and drawings, for example, in order to achieve this? Uh, I'm going to just... Um, and to the, everybody must know uh, what this ship is, of course, HMS Victory, currently undergoing its uh, first modern conservation program, and it's very comprehensive. But it is, in fact, 100 years exactly since HMS Victory was moved by the Society for Nautical Research into the dry dock in Portsmouth, where she currently resides. Prior to that, she'd been floating, if you can believe it. Uh, and it really is remarkable if you if you look on the uh, on the uh, conservation blog website that they have just how many similarities between HMS Victory the conservation of HMS Victory and and the Peggy the conservation of Peggy there are in fact we're even using the same paint researchers what I wanted to do was show you uh, the three dimensional scanning that they have uh, undertaken um, as part of their recording 
And I was going to send, I was going to show you a, a, a video of this, but really across Zoom, it just doesn't work very well. And so instead, I've got a few stills. So I'll show you those. And you may be familiar with these kinds of images um, from, um, from TV. Um, for example, I don't know if any of you saw the um, TV shows, um, Italy's Invisible Cities. They've done a whole series of these. They were um, presented by Alexander Armstrong, where they took uh, laser scans above and below ground and inside and outside of buildings to show the way that things are constructed. Um, and the lasers that they're using, creating these vast point clouds, clouds of little points of data in three-dimensional space, very much like this victory scan. It's an, it's an undifferentiated mass of three-dimensional data. If I want to cut out an individual timber from this, given this differentiated mass of data, I've got my work ahead of me because it's very, very difficult to do. And that's the story of this presentation, really. So if you want to know more about that, amazing project and remarkable challenges and the very high level of ambition that they're applying to it you can visit the national museum of the royal navy online or better still of course go down to uh, Portsmouth. this guy here is called uh pat tanner dr pat tanner was the person who eventually um unlocked this whole subject for me and um, I had a very interesting conversation and exchange of emails with Pat Tanner. Uh, he's based in Ireland. He's the author of this uh, amazing magisterial study of traditional boats of Ireland, which involves laser scanning um, hundreds of vessels. Um, and uh, he is, uh, apart from running his own company, which is called 3D Scanning Ireland Limited, He's also a postgraduate researcher in marine archaeology at the University of Southampton. That's what his doctorate is in. Um, it wasn't his work on the traditional boats of Ireland, amazing though it is, that drew me to him, though. It's his work on um, archaeological wrecks. In particular, um, uh, the following ones that I'm going to talk about. The first is the Bremen Cog, or the wreck of the Bremen Cog. Bremen Cog is a 14th century uh, Hanseatic trading vessel, which was ex excavated from the Vesa River in the 1960s. And uh, here you can see um, a photograph of the Bremen Cog dating from 1380, um, displayed in the German Maritime Museum in Bremerhaven. Now, Dr. Tanner has surveyed each of the individual timbers of this vessel using laser scanning and these individual images were then used to recreate the boat in virtual space so the, the and there is a point to this and i'll tell you what it was but so the first um the first exercise was to put the pieces back together again um to make a virtual copy in uh, computer-aided design so he takes his three-dimensional scans he translates them into computer-aided design models. He puts them together in the CAD software. And then after that, he uh, extrapolates by mirroring the form and various other things to create a three-dimensional version of, of the, this particular boat. Um, and he has rigged it. And the purpose for him is to run sailing simulations to find out how they were rigged and how they handled. That's his particular interest. Um, and it, it, he's also um, used this technique um, on other boats. For example, the um, the Newport ship, which is about the same age, I suppose you could say, um, and is an archaeological wreck that was found in the, in, the, uh, in the harbor in Newport in 2002. And it's an interesting project to visit online if you're interested again, because um, it, uh, it is currently going through um, 
PEG treatment, that's spraying with polyethylene glycol, very much like Mary Rose was in the 1980s, and in fact the Brayman Cog was in the 1960s, so predating Mary Rose by 20 years. And they are looking for funds to try and build a display facility for the Brayman, uh, for the um, Newport ship at this time. And he's also done um, images of the Dover boat, and uh, the Dover boat is a Bronze Age ship, um, and many others. And uh, Dr. Tanner was uh, instrumental in helping me with the following working method. So the first thing I did was to um, amass lots of three-dimensional data sets of PEGI. And some of these were created for me, um, and others I created myself. So this is an example of um, a point scan, a very raw point scan of the interior of Peggy looking towards the back. Um, very similar, you might say, to uh, those point scans of HMS Victory that I showed you a little bit before. Uh, and the next slide shows um, a rendered view of a scan of the exterior of Peggy that was prepared in 2010 using lasers um, by Conservation Technologies Liverpool. Um, a rendered view hides um, the true nature of this, which is which looks more like this. Um, it's a set of triangles, basically. So they've taken the point scan data, the point cloud, and they um, asked the computer to simplify it by making triangular surfaces between the various points and rationalizing it. Uh, so that's a triangulated mesh. And what I had to do with my point clouds, these things here, was to create a triangulated mesh um, myself um, of the interior, because conservation technologies only scanned the exterior of PEGI the purpose of that scan, uh, just in the side, was to make sure that when we moved the boat, there were no deformations and we would be able to compare um, the three-dimensional form of the boat as it is now to that which it had before it was moved. There was no deformation, thankfully. So anyway, here are some, here's a, um, a rendered view of a mesh that I created of the interior of the boat. It's a bit confusing. It's much easier to understand when you actually look inside the boat to see what you're looking at. Um, when you look at the outside of the scan, it's a bit confusing because all that is is the reverse of the three-dimensional image of the inside. That has to be put together and registered with the outside scans here. And all I can say is that uh, COVID didn't bring us anything but misery, but it did give me four months that I wouldn't otherwise have had. Uh, to use to uh, create all of this work. And that's how I spent lockdown. Um, first of all, amassing all of these 3D scans, registering them, putting them together, and then following a methodology that um, Dr. Tanner had suggested to me. And uh, the next steps took place in CAD software. The CAD software, for those of you who are interested, is Rhinoceros uh, 3D version 6. I was using at the time. And um, I have uh, prepared a little video that I hope um, you will be able to see. It's very short, that illustrates the technique that I was using to take this three dimensional mesh of triangles and chop out all the individual timbers from this boat and differentiate them and save them as separate entities. So it may be a bit jerky, but bear with it, because um, uh, if it doesn't show well, um, there's a link at the end that will enable you to um, visit YouTube and have a look at the original on YouTube. It's just that playing a video on my computer here and sending it out across the internet renders it rather jerky. Here we go. Um, let's see if a bit of unwanted noise. Sorry about that. Some clicking. So here I'm zooming in on the on the uh, 
rendered three-dimensional form of the boat. I hope it's not too blurred for you. Um, and then I'm going to a triangulated view. I'm going to um, draw a line using the tools along one of the frames inside the boat. These frames are oak cut pieces of timber that rigidify the planking after the shell of the boat has been built. And I want to draw a picture of that frame. So I'm going to draw around it and in the next little bit you'll see, hopefully, mine's very blurred, I hope yours isn't. Um, a curve, an outline of the side of one of those frames. And in the next few moves, I'm going to attempt to uh, make a surface out of that. So there's a surface inside that curve now. And then I'm going to um, extrude that surface along a little line that I've drawn and make that surface into a three-dimensional form. And this is just one of the techniques that I used to create three-dimensional representations of Peggy's timbers. So there I've extruded that form and it now begins to resemble a timber frame in the boat. And I can move it around and fiddle with it. I can adjust it as well. And that's important because when um, I put it back into the scan of the boat, here and uh, twizzle that around, you'll see that it's not especially accurate. So I have to do quite a lot of adjustments to make that three-dimensional form conform to the gnarly, worn surfaces in the boat. What I'm looking for is a CAD representation of each individual timber that conforms as closely as I can possibly make it to the original timbers. Again, apologies if that video was blurred and there is a link to it at the end of the presentation. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, actually a three-dimensional view in uh, Rhino 3D uh, of all of the frames of Peggy divorced from their planking. So I've, I've hidden all of the planking and um, the benches and forts and, and mast steps and all the other kinds of things that the boat has in it. And all you can see is the frames. And you can see what a, what a forest of frames there are. And the one that we're working on, I don't know if you'll be able to see my cursor, is, is this one here uh, just now. And uh, there are lots. In, in the CAD software, I can individually I, um, select one of these and I can annotate it. I can make um, observations on it. I can draw little points on it and refer to those. I can use it to link to websites or external reports. I can do all sorts of things like that. And that, um, that is the real power of this, um, this rendition of the boat in three dimensions. That's what I'm hoping to use it for. Uh, now, we are not the only people thinking in terms of this sort of recording. In fact, um, professionals who are conserving historic buildings and structures, like Gothic cathedrals, are using this kind of technology more and more. They're borrowing techniques that are developed in the modern construction industry. And um, these are um, under an umbrella standard now called Building Information Model or BIM. And English Heritage or Historic England, I always forget which is which now, sorry, um, have produced guidance on uh, BIM, Building Information Modeling for Heritage. Here's a picture of the front cover of their report. It's here online. Um, it's not a great read, sorry. Um, but this new standard, Building Information Model, allows the individual elements of an architectural structure, such as the one you see illustrated there, to be given material characteristics, to, uh, to act as a canvas upon which observations can be made and to, uh, to be freighted with documentation in exactly the way that I was looking to try to do all those years ago when I was working in France and couldn't. And these kinds of standards have been used, especially in France, to great effect. 
And you'll all be aware of what happened to poor Notre Dame in Paris with the terrible fire that ripped through the roof and destroyed the medieval vault. The roof, I should say, was 19th century, but nevertheless. Um, by remarkable uh, piece of good fortune, uh, a very detailed point cloud, uh, laser scanned point cloud, this time in full color, was created by Andrew Talam of uh, Vassar College in New York in 2010. And this has proved absolutely critical to the creation of uh, a canvas upon which to plan uh, the conservation and restoration of uh, the vault of this cathedral. So uh, the point cloud was used to uh, create these images. This is, uh, these images were created by the American software giant Autodesk, 3D modeling uh, software uh, giant. Um, so they've taken the point cloud and they've um, uh, rationalized the building elements into, into architectural features. And this is now being used as the basis for building information modeling for Notre Dame in Paris. And eventually what it will allow them to do is differentiate the uh, CAD model right down to the level of individual stones and record their observations in that way. Building information management is, a, is an internationally accepted standard. It isn't primarily about three-dimensional modeling, but it's a standard within which we may be able to operate our recordings of, 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 uh, of historic structures like Notre Dame or even Peggy or, or Victory in future. So there's a lot of potential there. And in some ways, in working on Peggy in three dimensions in the way that I am doing, we're pushing pushing, pushing the, the, the technology and what's possible, because nobody has actually tried to, um, to use computer-aided design to record a, a real object in quite the way that I'm doing with Peggy, so far as I'm aware, anywhere in the world. Um, and that's pretty much, um, pretty much getting towards the end of my talk. There is just one uh, little thing that I have to show you, and I hope that this one behaves itself. This is uh, a video of the of the exploded Peggy, that's the, all of the individual elements of Peggy that I've got, they're all spread out. And if I press the button, I should be able to get the video to draw them all together. And I hope that you enjoy watching this. I find it endlessly fascinating. There are about 600 elements that I've drawn. Uh, to comprise that. That's, uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. Um, the links that I, pro I, I promised that I would share with you are on this page here. Um, there will be a recording of the presentation, and if anybody is interested, I can send these links to them uh, after the fact. Thank you. Huge thank you to Christopher Weeks. No, no, no presentation like this. Um happens without a huge amount of effort. And of course, we're also enjoying the benefits of all those years of experience that, that Christopher brings with him in, in this particular uh, discipline. So it, it is a real treat for us to have a have an hour with someone um, who's got so much experience and has uh, so generously put it together in that presentation. So Christopher, huge thanks from, uh, from UCM and myself, and I'm sure everyone here in the Zoom room. That's it for tonight, folks. Once again, thank you for coming and great thanks to Dr. Florida Clements for her presentation on the Alaman all dressed up, but nowhere to go. We'll see. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.